to uh, the first talk of Hepatia AQC series. Uh, we are very delighted to have you, uh, and we are extremely honored to have Nada Wael Samir uh, El Sokari today here with us to talk about adiabatic quantum computation with financial applications. We wanted to have Nada first uh, as a young, famous uh, researcher in, in the field of quantum annealing and. Uh, it is great to uh, to empower women more and more in in, in, in such uh, an emerging uh, and important field in, in the quantum uh, industry. So uh, I think that uh, Professor Ahmed Yunus would like to say a few words first, and and then uh, I think uh, the floor will be uh, will be yours, Nada. Hello, Nada. Uh, we are uh, very happy to have you in the first Habatia uh, 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 talk uh, in, in in the Alexandria Quantum Computing Group. I, I ask the organizer to make you the first talk because Hepatia is uh, a, a famous Egyptian scientist, female Egyptian scientist, right? Do you know Hepatia? Nada. I actually didn't. I actually didn't. But when I Googled Did you her, I, about her, yeah, I felt like these are really big shoes to fill. I got really excited. Yeah, OK. Uh, so um, uh, Nada uh, is the first undergraduate uh, in applied mathematics and statistics uh, from Khalifa University, UAE. Uh, she has graduated with the highest honor, uh, and uh, she is currently completing her master's degree in computer science, right? Um, and she's doing research uh, now in the prediction of Alzheimer disease uh, using uh, deep learning. Uh, and uh, I think she uh, 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 is the first uh, users in UAE uh, to use uh, 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 D-Wave in, in, in quantum computing research. So uh, we are uh, uh, expecting uh, a very interesting talk, uh, uh, Nada. Uh, and the floor is yours. You can you can start your talk uh, when you are ready. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honestly extremely honored, um, and I I hope I can give everybody a little taste of the beautiful math that we did a few years ago. So um, today I'll be talking about the implementation of adiabatic quantum computing using the D-Wave uh, computer. Um, where they use quantum annealing. I'll explain sort of the differences between adiabatic quantum computing and quantum annealing, but also how they're extremely similar. Um, and through that, I'll also be showing how we would program a D-Wave quantum computer. Um, and I'll use the Markowitz model uh, as, a, as an example uh, of how to do that, a real problem that we actually solved on the computer. Okay, so. Um, the general idea of adiabatic quantum computing is evolving a system's Hamiltonian, this H, uh, Hamiltonian from its ground state to a final state defined by the problem that we aim to minimize. Now, what this Hamiltonian is, is essentially a matrix with time-dependent coefficients that corresponds to the total energy of a physical system. So uh, later, we're going to talk about how to construct this matrix, but essentially at the beginning of the program, this A of T, uh, sorry, uh, B of T is zero, uh, at time is zero. And so the, the um, Hamiltonian is at its ground state. And then by the end of it, at the end time, uh, A of T becomes zero and B of T, uh, H, HF is, is the Hamiltonian that we're working with. Um, so the system slowly over time will reach this final state and still, um, to find this low state, low energy state, sorry, low energy state. Uh, and that low energy state will be exactly the solution we're looking for. Uh, and that's really cool because adiabatic quantum computing is actually universal because there's a mapping between the adiabatic model and the gate model. Uh, but today we're gonna be talking about quantum annealing. Now quantum annealing is not universal, but it's very similar to adiabatic quantum computing. So, um, and it's what the D-Wave computers actually use. Um, they implement the adiabatic quantum computing algorithm uh, through the quantum annealing algorithm. So in quantum annealing, this ground state is actually um, a quantum mechanical superposition of all of the possible solutions um, or states, and they all have equal weights. And in this case, instead of evolving the system slowly enough, well, slowly, uh, with air quotes, uh, but uh, in this case, we actually evolve it very quickly, but um, 
even though we can't, we haven't guaranteed that there's an exact solution in this case, the solution is usually good enough with a much faster, um, uh, with a huge speed up in time. So um, this process is technically a very powerful heuristic for solving problems. So the equation here, um, according to Klimko et al, is considered to be the quantum annealing program, which define, which is just this time dependent Hamiltonians. And uh, we move from that ground state to the final Hamiltonian, which is actually defined by our problem. So this is the one that's really important here. So how do we actually transform an optimization problem into this HF that we're looking for? How do we, how do we create HF? Um, so before I do that, I'll talk about a little bit of the, pro the, the overview of the process that we're going to go through. Um, so we first begin with a quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problem. So the, the variables have quadratic interdependencies, they have no constraints, and they have to be binary in order for us to be able to operate on the D-Wave computer. Um, this is obviously a little bit of a limitation. But there are many ways to transform problems into cubos, which is what we have to do for the financial problem that we're going to talk about. After that, we transform it to the icing form, or icing. I, <laughs> I don't want to butcher the name, but uh, we do this. And then we extract an adjacency matrix, which gives us the problem graph. And after that, we're able to move from the problem graph to the hardware graph and sort of program hardware, hard code the problem into the hardware of the of the computer uh, using a function that's an embedding. Sorry, the lights turned off here because they're motion sensing. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about our problem first. Um, the we're going to talk about portfolio optimization, and essentially what that is is I have a bunch of assets, um, a bunch of stocks that I want to decide where to invest uh, my budget, how to how to best invest into this port, um, these options. So these AIs are my assets and RI here is the return on that asset, what I expect to get back from that asset. And so my, my portfolio as a whole is this R, which is just the summation of the how much I invested into the asset and the expected return per stock. Um, so my goal here is to maximize my expected return and minimize my risk. And Markowitz defined risk by the covariance between the assets. So he said that um, the he would look at the behavior of the assets over time. And if the assets went up and down together, they had a higher risk than if they had opposing um, behavior because you want to diversify. So if something goes wrong in the market, you still have assets in a different part of the market that will behave differently. Um, so. Essentially, our problem is to maximize this part, minimize this part, and stay within a budget. Okay, but this is not exactly a quadratic unconstrained Kubo problem, so quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problem, because these AIs are not binary. They're actually the value of how much I'm going to invest in the asset. So for our problem, we had to sort of relax the model a little bit and, and change it up. So instead, our AIs now are binary variables, zeros or ones, zero for don't invest, and one for invest. We assign each asset a individual budget that if I invest in this asset, I am going to invest capital AI into that asset. And so on for, for all assets. So now my expected return looks like this, my risk looks like this, and my I we also had to incorporate the budget constraint because it can't be constrained. So um, this is just something that squares any difference. If we go below budget or above budget, then this term will blow up and now our minimization is a pro has a problem. So this is sort of a way to incorporate the constraints that were causing us issues with our Kubo. So um, also these data values here are just to define sort of preferences for the investor. So if the investor prefers to penalize, so he cares more about return and doesn't care that much about risk, then you would have a higher theta for return. If you care, if you really want to be cautious, then you would put a higher risk. If you are, you know, you have a very strict budget, you would put a high term on the budget. So this is exactly the problem that we would like to translate 
into the quantum computer. Um, but how are we going to do that? Well, first, um, actually, we, we did do this problem uh, in 2017. Uh, we, we actually had 63 assets that we optimized on the D-Wave computer. Um, so 63 assets from the LW Exchange specifically um, to show the, diff the, the speed up in the performance. So the first thing we do is we kind of reorder and rescale the, the coefficients. So we take any of the quadratic terms that were here. So these are quadratic. Um, these would be quadratic. Some of them would be quadratic. So uh, actually, you'll, yeah. So we take all of the quadratic terms and we put them in J. Uh, the quadratic coefficients would be in Jij. The linear coefficients would be in Hi, and any constants would be this gamma. So um, you'll notice that over here, this is a covariance, which means that that's a quadratic term, a quadratic coefficient. But because this is between Ri and itself, essentially it becomes a linear term because we're talking about binary optimization. So the terms, uh, whenever Ri is one, the other one is one, so one squared is one. And again, with the zero, zero squared is one. So it's, a, it's almost like I'm just doing Ri. Um, so yeah, so the most, the most important part here is these Jij terms. They are what they call what we call a coupling. They define the coupling that we're going to do. So what coupling is is uh, when I couple two qubits, I'm actually setting the strength and the direction of the entanglement that happens between them. So in the program, this is this is when I when I define a coupling between two variables ai and aj, I'm saying those two variables behave in this way with respect to each other. Um, and so if if I want them to be the ones at the same time, it's like a direct entanglement. And then I could do an opposing entanglement. So it would be one is zero and the other one has to be one and so on. Okay, so then after I do this and I come up with my little um, terms over here, um, this will give, I can transform this into uh, the matrix representation. And from that, I can get all of these um, quadratic term coefficients, they'll give me an adjacency matrix. So I just write those terms in an adjacency matrix, and that just gives me the coupling between this, um, the, the term over here, the, the variable here, and this variable, the first variable and the second variable, and so on. Uh, and again, it's zeros on the diagonal because of the variance being uh, transformed to a linear term. Uh, the other thing to note here is that if this graph is all only zeros on the diagonal, then this is a fully connected. This is this is going to create a very dense problem for me. So after this, I can use this adjacency matrix to draw a problem graph or to define the problem graph. So every every node here would be a variable, and every edge between it is a coupling between that variable and the next. And so this would be a fully connected graph, uh, problem graph, a complete graph, sorry, complete graph. Uh, if, again, if it's only zeros here, which is exactly what happened with our um, Markowitz model, it was a fully connected, uh, or sorry, not fully connected, because it's a complete graph um, of 63 variables. Okay. So, after I have my problem graph, what I need to do is to embed this into the hardware graph. I have to physically tell the quantum computer which qubits are to be um, entangled using that that uh, Jij coupling. So um, there's many ways to do these embeddings, and the um, we use it to map each qubit to one or more qubits in the problem in the in the hardware. So if my problem had 63 variables, I'm not just going to have 63 qubits on the computer that are corresponding to my variables. I might have um, three qubits per variable that are all acting together as one. Um, and that sort of helps reduce the noise in the, in the quantum computer. So there are many heuristics that we can use to find this embedding, which is just a function that says this 
this this variable is assigned to this many qubits. This variable is assigned to that many qubits. Um, so we have a lot of algorithms to find these, but actually in 2018, uh, Dr. Faisal and I, uh, along with the team at Oak Ridge National Lab, showed that there exists an optimal embedding for any problem graph into the hardware graph. We can find one that is the best. Now, the problem is how to find that one is, is the harder task. Uh, and if that is going to improve, uh, the time is different. Um, and that should probably be researched. So now, once my embedding was found, um, we end up with uh, the Hamiltonian, the, the final Hamiltonian that I want my pr program to evolve into. And I can run the program onto the quantum computer. And the, um, the uh, so when we ran our model with the 63 variables, we compared it to a classical computer and um, the quantum computer at the time, which was, I think it was 128 qubits. Um, and it was still, the problem was still too large for that computer. So it, you had to run it in sub problems. Um, but the genetic algorithm that I used on my classical computer uh, took five seconds to run that problem since it was pretty small. Uh, but the quantum algorithm took as little as 20 microseconds. And um, we actually increased the anneal time to two milliseconds and it ended up yielding similar pro, uh, portfolios, but we only had slightly lower costs. So even, even the increased time didn't help that much. Um, so that, that was an incredible speed up of like 250,000. And uh, it, it was pretty um, cool results that we got. Uh, so there are still limitations to this um, technique and those are because it's a heuristic. So we cannot say that the solution that we found is the true solution. There's no way to guarantee that. Um, however, it is pretty fast, so we can sort of ignore that for the mean, in the meantime, since we're already using heuristics in our problems classically. Uh, we can we can use a faster heuristic. That's that's nice. Um, the other thing is that the size um, is an issue. So right now, the the largest one that they've come up with is the five thousand uh, qubit. Uh, they call it Advantage, it's the newest one. Um, and so that can solve a big problem, but again, we might have problems with thousands of variables that might need larger computers. Um, but it seems that you know we're heading in the direction of bigger and better. Um, the last thing is the limitation on the type of the problem. So the fact that we're constrained to only quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problems uh, or sampling problems, it's 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 not that easy to just find a problem that's exactly in that form. So to be able to transform problems into that form is a, is an issue, um, but that still doesn't stop us. Uh, actually, despite those limitations, we continue to use that obvious time advantage and um, to solve larger and hopefully real time problems. So what Dr. Faisal and I are working on in Dark Star Quantum Labs is something called Schedule, which is going to optimize air traffic control and help with making flight decisions. Uh, and I, I'm sure Dr. Faisal in his talk will uh, let you know more about that. He's supposed to give a talk on the 20th, uh, which is exciting. So that's something to look forward to. Um, so yeah, this was kind of what we did and I would be open to uh, questions and a big discussion. That would be nice right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Nada, very much for the for the talk. This is really interesting, uh, really interesting uh, uh, experience. Um, um, I think if if anyone uh, would like to ask anything, the the question the, the chat is open, so please ask, um, and we will deliver the question to Nada. Uh, in the meanwhile, I'd like to ask you, Nada, um, yep. uh, why quantum annealing is not universal? Uh, you mentioned in in the in the beginning of your talk. Mm -hmm. uh, so why it is not universal? What is the limitation of quantum annealing to solve problems? Well, the limitation is that the, the 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 problems that it can it can't solve all problems, and it's it's um, it's it doesn't follow the gate model at all. 
Um, and it's also, so basically adiabatic quantum computing says that we need to let the system evolve slowly. Uh, and again, slowly is, is a, slowly. But uh, in um, quantum annealing, what we do is we set the time. We don't, we don't wait for it to evolve on its own. We set the specific time. So it doesn't, it doesn't follow the theorem anymore that guarantees that it's an exact solution. Okay. So um, uh, about using D-Wave, um, can you give us your, your experience on, on using D-Wave, the, the quantum computer itself? So I personally did not, you know, use the quantum computer myself. I wasn't there in person. We were working with a, um, a team in Oak Ridge National Labs in the U.S. They had access to the quantum computer, but uh, it's as easy as programming in Python, because after after we were done with this project, I was able to get access to the files that um, allow you to transform the problem into the right form for the quantum computer and send it to the quantum computer. Uh, at the time, actually, the uh, we didn't have access to uh, D-Wave computers because it was only available for uh, North America. Um, and so now, now it's now it's available, and it's again, it's just as easy as learning some Python code and transforming the problem into the right form. Uh, actually, we, we have a comment from Dr. Faisal. Uh, hello, oh, Dr. Dr. Faisal. Faisal. Uh, actually, um, uh, Dr. Faisal with us. Uh, you can unmute if you have a comment. You can. I'd like to hear your voice. Hi, Professor Yunus, hello, how are you? Hello, how are you, Dr. Faisal? Awesome, doing well. Nada, how are you? I'm doing good. Yeah, very very nice presentation as, as always. I uh, was very excited to hear that presentation. Uh, my comment was uh, just to, to kind of, you know, point out that uh, even when we were working on this problem back in 2017, uh, the processor we used had 2,000 qubits. Um, rather than, I think you, you said 128. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so it's big enough at that time. <laughs> Very interesting. So how, how many qubits in the wave now? 5,000. 5,000. I, I didn't work on the wave myself, but I'm, I, I'm looking forward for my first program on the wave soon. So. So uh, we have oh. uh, we have a question. Uh, hi Nada, great work from Muhammad Shafiq. Uh, hi Nada, great work. Uh, I was wondering how slowly uh, evolving system arrive at a solution. Uh, is this similar to multi-dimensional searching? Um. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what um, multi-dimensional searching is, if, if it's a specific term that I'm not uh, familiar with, but uh, it's essentially, yeah, it's, so it's, it's trying to, it's starting at a state and trying to settle into the lowest energy state that it can have. Um, and so you can imagine it like a, like a, a ball rolling on a, on a landscape and it's trying to reach the lowest point in that landscape. Um, yeah, I hope that answered it. Okay. Uh, Karim, is there any questions? I, I, I can see. Um, can you check? Well, uh, up until now, uh, those only two questions that you that you already uh, asked, but nothing more. Uh, please, any, uh, anyone, if, if you would like to, to ask any question, please raise your hand. OK, uh, Dr. Faisal ha has a question, I think. So uh, you can unmute yourself. Go ahead. Thank you, Kareem. I I'm hoping we can have uh, motivate some discussion from uh, all the attendees as well. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of basically, uh, you know, asking a question with respect to that. Uh, I was wondering, Nada, what, what do you think, uh, and Professor Yunus, um, What's the scope, you know, for for um, from a commercial point of view? What's the scope of of quantum computing in general, and specifically quantum annealers? And how would you uh, 
um, possibly compare, I guess it's, it's maybe not the right word here, but how would you characterize quantum annealing versus, you know, other quantum computing platforms in terms of their usage right now? <laughs> Sorry, I thought the question was for Dr. Yunus, so. Um... No, it's not my day to answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I think I think the fact that the the sheer size of the computers, the fact that they have um, so many qubits that we it's, that we could solve lo a lot larger problems, um, and also the the fact that uh, you know the the world runs on money basically. So uh, if we can solve financial problems in general or have certain cost functions that we can minimize then i think that's that that's you know the world wants to go where the money's at so and that's where d-wave is very nice um actually that i i have a question uh, you yeah. mentioned that uh, uh, you used 128 qubits uh, in your uh, in your problem solve, solve your problem right uh well dr faisal corrected me it was the, 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 the processor was i think 2000 but you 2000. used 128 or you used the whole 2000 no i i think i got i i was mixed up i think they also ran it on the 128 simulator uh but uh, it was all it was run on two thousand. I I don't know if it used specifically two thousand qubits. I, it definitely used less than that. It was only sixty three variables. So how 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 about the size of the problem you you were solving? Uh, it was it was just sixty three variables. So sixty three um, decisions and decision variables that we were making. So did you really need all these uh, qubits to solve the problem or? Uh, <laughs> No, of course not. <laughs> I mean, it was easily solved in five seconds on, on my computer. Uh, well, not solved. Again, it was you know, closely solved. Uh, but uh, it, the, the idea is to show the, the amount that the speed up was. So it was five seconds on my computer, but it was 20 microseconds. So for a much larger problem, on a hopefully much larger computer, it would uh, would be a very powerful result. Okay, I think uh, there's someone uh, who would like to, to ask a question. His name is, is uh, just a second, uh, I will unmute him. Okay, I think you can, right now you can, uh, you can talk, uh, Mr. Pratik. Uh, Please thank you, sir. Uh, I had a question that, uh, for example, uh, I am searching something on a normal computer, and uh, if my list increases by n times, then uh, or my search time will also increase by n times. So, is there any advantage in uh, quantum calculation, uh, doing calculations on a quantum computer that uh, it would reduce time or by any factor. Is there any specific factor? Like, uh, to be honest, I have heard that it is some root n factor that if my uh, uh, search list would increase by n square, then I will just require the factor will just uh, increase by root n or something like that. I have heard. Hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure about search uh, specifically, just because the the ADA, the quantum annealer uh, only deals with optimization and um, but so theoretically it should be that, but the there is certain noise that comes into the system because we are storing the information in the energy of the system, so the, the temperature of the system. Um, so I don't know. I don't. I wouldn't say that it's there yet. Uh, okay. I'm not I sure think, if okay, we have uh, another question. Patrick uh, is asking about quantum searching in general or quantum searching on the wave systems. So I think his question is not clear. If he can clarify the question. I 
another question from uh, Muhammad Shafiq. Uh, uh, he is asking how uh, would you compare uh, simulated annealing in our typical AI class uh, versus quantum simulated annealing. So he's asking you about um, the difference between simulated annealing uh, and quantum simulated annealing. So okay. um, it, it's pretty similar. I mean, it's, it's faster, but it's pretty similar in the sense that uh, we are talking about temperature um, to or the energy of the system. Uh, again, and uh, the thing about it is that quantum annealing gets to utilize certain quantum properties in the system. So we get stuff like quantum tunneling, where you end up, you don't get stuck in local minima, you can zoom past a, a hill, um, which I guess sim simulated annealing does do, but uh, quantum tunneling does it with special um, quantum properties because of the entanglement. Okay, I think uh, uh, there's someone who would like to, to ask. Just a second, I will let him to be unmuted. Uh, Mr. Mr. Vladimir, can you please uh, unmute yourself? Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation indeed. Um, I, I, I may want to ask the same question, maybe like from different perspective though. So like commercial versus scientific value. So I think that this quantum computing thing is extremely useful from the scientific, from applied physics perspective, but from the commercial perspective, like, you know, like when, when we say a lot of interesting things, right, and people get people attention, but at the end of the day, if we don't deliver value, we kind of de 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 <laughs> dissolve the proposition, right? Uh, and my kind of question for you, uh, are we kind of rushing things a little bit too fast? Um, what do you think? Um, I I can't say that we are. I think I think this is just the beginning. Um, but I mean, either way, you are not guaranteed to get an exact solution for large, you know, um, commercial problems. Uh, but quantum computing, at least the quantum the quantum annealing, can guarantee good enough solutions uh, in a much much faster time so it, there is there is an advantage to it as if you're working with uh, large enough problems so people from high frequency trading platforms should be calling you right away right yes they should <laughs> thank you very much thank you uh, another, uh, we have another question. Uh, you mentioned your problem uh, has um, 63 variables, right? Yeah. So uh, if one is trying to solve 64 variables, for example, so how many qubits are required? For 64? 64 or 65. Oh, so if they okay. are trying to solve a bigger problem, so how many qubits on the wave uh, they, they, they are going to, to use? Okay, well, well, you would need at least 63, obviously. Um, as for how many, it depends on the problem. So it depends on how dense the problem graph is, because if, it, if it's not that dense, then the... So, okay, I don't think I have this in my uh, presentation, but the hardware graph is more sparse than the problem, that is, is pretty sparse. And so, um, if the problem graph is just as sparse as the hardware graph, then you would need less qubits. Then, um, but if it's a really dense problem, I'm, I, I don't know the exact number. I, I have to say that. I don't know the exact number, but you would need a lot more than 63. Um. I can see any more questions. Uh, can you, uh, Karim, can you check if there is any more questions? Okay, sure. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, there is uh, someone who would like to ask. Uh, Mr. Muhammad, uh, Dr. Muhammad, can, can, can you please unmute yourself? Hello? Okay, Dr. Muhammad. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Nida. I want to ask you uh, what is the success probability of uh, 
solving your problem using the waves computer. The probability yes. of success, you mean? Yes. Okay. Um, I I don't think I we made that calculation. He, he, I think he's asking about the probability of success. The, the true solution. Find the problem. true solution. Maybe. Yeah. Um, I, I can't. I don't know. I have to say, I don't know. If maybe if Dr. Facelo can come in, <laughs> <laughs> save the day. <laughs> Oh yeah, I I think so. The question was, um, what's the probability of success, right? How 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 do we know that the answer we're getting is actually a good enough answer? So if that's the question, then uh, uh, the the I guess the the way to address that is to say that um, you know these are probabilistic devices, right? So which is why you typically run a problem like the one another worked on um, several times. So, so it takes, you know, I think, for example, you would run this, um, you know, a hundred times or a thousand times, maybe even more times, right? Uh, 10,000 times. And you would then get a distribution of answers. And uh, from that distribution, you, in, in, in a very rough sense, you would just say, pick the one that's most, you know, frequently occurring. And, and that's your good enough answer. So there's definitely an element of being, you know, good enough. Right, there's no exact answer, but is it good enough? And many times in the industry, um, that's what people are looking for because the ex getting the exact answer may be too too challenging. Right, so that is effectively how we were looking at it at least in 2017, uh, if I remember correctly. And uh, it may be the case that now in 2021, in the you know intervening years, things have improved. Perhaps, um, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have a any updates from my side on on how they may have improved, but uh, that's that's how I would address uh, the question that was raised here. Yeah, thank okay, thank you, Dr. Faisal. Thank you, Nada. Um, actually, we have um, uh, another question uh, from David uh, Wellington, uh, and I think um, he he wants uh, Nada and me to answer the question. So Nada will be first. <laughs> uh, uh, the question is uh, well done uh, on a very clear and uh, uh, thorough explained presentation, Nada. With respect to the recent uh, retraction, Microsoft had to make uh, on their work using. Um, I, I can't read this. Majorna Fermions. How do you see? Sorry? Uh, Majorana. Majorana Fermions. What's mm -hmm. this? I, I didn't. <laughs> I don't know this. Uh, how do you see future work uh, with uh, uh, Anion or other particle-based hardware applications used to construct qubit systems, fitting into the quantum technology ecosystem long term? Uh, this very long question, uh, uh, David. Um. So <laughs> maybe you can you can. Uh, ask you using voice to explain, make it easier for us. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Karim, can you? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm working on it. Ask just David to, to unmute. Yeah, just a second. Okay, I think, uh, I think that he can, he can unmute himself now. Uh, David, can you ask uh, your question again um, by voice? Um, I think he unmuted himself, but um, we, we can't hear you. You are unmuted. Can can you please say something? David? Oh. Uh, he's, he oh, has uh, some function. problem in his mic, in his microphone. So I will read his, um, his question again. Um, uh, Nada, well done on a very clear and uh, thorough explained presentation. Uh, with respect to the recent retraction, uh, Microsoft had to make on their own, uh, on their work using 
دكتور فيصل ذا وورد اجين ماريوانا ماريوانا فيرميوز هاو دو يو سي سوري وات ذيس ماريوانا نو نو اي دونت اي ام نوت شور ذيس ذا كوريكت وورد نو هاو دو يو سي هاو دو يو سي فيوتشر وورد ويز ايونز اور اذر بارتي بيزد هاردوير ابلكيشن يوز تو كونستراكت كيوبيت سيستم Fitting into the quantum technology ecosystem long term. Okay, I'm going to have to start with the fact that I'm not very familiar with the retraction. Okay. Uh, can can Doctor Faisal explain this word to us? Because this yes, is really new. Yes, I would love me. for I, that. I, I, I don't understand this word. Uh, I, I would be happy to, but I think Karim knows a little bit about this. Karim, do you want to take this? Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. You're muted. Okay. Okay. So, uh, based on my limited experience, uh, I think that Microsoft was hoping to, or, or was trying to, to to construct qubits out of topological qubits. Okay. So, uh, this this kind of technology, they were hoping for finding like a particle that can, that that actually has some sort of um, like uh, some properties that do not exist, for example, in in, in ions or, or superconducting circuits or even photons. Uh, and based on that, uh, their their fidelity or their theoretical fidelity is, is very high and uh, they have longer coherent times. But uh, the problem was that uh, during uh, the experiment, they actually ignored some of uh, the results and those results will, uh, were very, very important. And they did it included in, in the paper that was actually uh, published in Nature. So uh, at the end, after like, I think two years, uh, uh, they found out that uh, it is completely wrong and, uh, and uh, they had to retract everything. And then Microsoft said that uh, it was uh, a fault from one of their professors or researchers. They didn't even take it into account. And, and, and that is actually uh, pretty much annoying to me, <laughs> at least. Mm -hmm. uh, so re regarding uh, the particle thing or, or, or building the technology upon any, any kind of particles like anions or Mari uh, Mariana or whatever the name of it, uh, I, I don't think that uh, it might fit in the current technology because we have some limits at interacting with very, very small atomic particles. And, 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 that is, uh, and that is a problem. But recently, uh, I, think, I think perhaps uh, one, of, like, one of the good things about, uh, about, uh, about the current quantum technology is that it, it pushes the limits of engineering so that right now uh, IBM has actually achieved uh, a new milestone where they can actually uh, watch uh, the transition of the electron like from from the ground state to to the upper state and then they can capture it and then bring, uh, bring it down so that actually uh, made them uh, able to uh, to do some some mid circuit uh, measurements and 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 that that wasn't actually uh, like like uh, that wasn't actually uh, available like in, in in the past few years so who, who knows what, what could happen uh, the, the current you know the, the market will will decide everything in, in the future that, that that is my my own opinion about it so um, what do you think dr Faisal? Oh, oh, I think that was a great, uh, you know, great response uh, to that comment from David. Uh, you know, we got some background on what actually happened at Microsoft. And, uh, you know, if I can add my own two cents here, you know, the, the whole debacle was kind of an example of how not to do science, right? Uh, my own personal opinion is that, you know, academics should be allowed to do science. Uh, that has always been the traditional model, right? Because they're not necessarily, well, academics who are not funded from the industry. And whenever that happens, mm -hmm. it, should be, it should be qualified, right? There's a whole thing called, uh, you know, uh, about um, conflict of interest that you have to clarify when you publish science and results and stuff like that. So it was unfortunate, but, you know, we move on. And uh, good to hear that, you know, IBM has some uh, new control over their qubits and that's... Yeah an improvement forward so wonderful mm -hmm. 
Um, okay. Another question, I think, from, from David. Uh, basically, do you see anything other than photons being widely used ever at any point? So, I, what do you think, Nada? I don't know. <laughs> I, have to, um, I have to say that my, my experience is very, uh, you know, <laughs> limited right now. I'm still learning about That's all the different types. So, um, I am not the expert on this. So I think photons is not um, widely used maybe in, in, in quantum quantum cryptography, quantum key distribution, uh, but um, most of the quantum computers we use on, on cloud like IBM and, and Google, they are not using photons, they are using uh, uh, superconducting uh, qubits, right? So mm -hmm. um, yes, th there is other uh, qubits uh, other than photons uh, um, is, is, is widely used. If this answer your question, David. So it is uh, it is called uh, uh, Majorana fermions, right? I think I, I pronounced it correct now. <laughs> Little help from. Uh, OK. Majorana. Mayor, I think I think Mayo, Mayo, like the, the the J is a Y for some reason. <laughs> this is how they pronounce it on uh, Google uh, search. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so is it Hepatia or hi, hi, Hypatia? Hepatia. I, I saw both. Okay. Hepatia makes yeah, more it, sense. It, 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 Hypatia is English uh, uh, version. Uh, um, British English or English um, American English. Mm. So we, we, we pronounce it Hepatia. But Hepatia is, is, is correct as well. So, um, any any more questions? Okay, I think uh, Liz has uh, has a question. Okay, um, I think uh, okay, we will wait for it. Okay, okay, she she wants to, to ask it in person. Okay, just a second. Okay, I, I think you can unmute yourself. Can can you can you please unmute yourself? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Excellent, excellent topic. Uh, I'm not in quantum computing, but I do have a quick question with the, the graph, the problem graph that um, is all mm -hmm. nodes and, and links. Is yes. that something that is um, heavily used to, to transform to the hardware problem? It's just very it's, fascinating to see it here. So it's a, it's a, I don't know how to explain this. It is not, it's not a physical graph. It's more just a notation, sort of. So we change from, um, so these these uh, up here would be sort of indices that that say this is the first variable, second variable, third variable, and so on. And you can look at the interactions of all of those variables with these other variables over here, first variable, second variable, third variable, as a graph where the variables are the nodes. And every time there's a non-zero number in the matrix, that is an edge between that node and the, the other node that it's core ball spawning. So if it was node one and two over here, then there would be an edge between node one and node two. Um, and on the edge would be that weight, that number that's over here. So it's just a, a different view of the problem. Thank you for that, and, and I, yeah. I agree. Um, I'm coming from the world uh, of linked data, metadata, linking the nodes. Um, mm. And so, yes, I was just curious if, if if this is an area of research or this is strictly just a, a mathematical tool that's quite useful. Oh, no, it's, it's definitely a big area of research. I mean, I think you're talking about graph theory. Correct, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. But, but in quantum computing, is it a, is it a prominent or? or? Uh, well, I mean, I can only speak to the research that I did, um, where we did use graph theory to prove, um, in conjunction with game theory, that this embedding here from the problem graph to the hardware graph is actually, op there's an optimal one. So there's definitely room for that kind of research. Okay, thank you very much. I think Dr. Faisal also wants to speak on that because we worked yeah. on that together. 
Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for noticing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I'm jumping in because, yeah, this is, you know, mathematics. So I, I'm a, mm -hmm. trained as an applied mathematician, so I like to talk about math whenever I get a chance. Uh, so Lisa, uh, your, your question exactly, yeah, it's it's about, it, your question was whether this is a prominent, uh, plays a prominent role in quantum computing. So certainly in the area of hardware, right? And I think this would be true for, you know, classical hardware um, in, in, a, in, in a sense. In fact, it is. Uh, so let me share a story here. Uh, when I was an undergraduate student, um, this was uh, late 90s in California, Santa Clara University, uh, there was a talk given by a prominent mathematician who had worked at, I think, IBM for several years and then uh, moved into uh, academia. Him and his wife had proved some very nice results pertaining to graph theory and uh, VLSI design, which was quite a big thing, uh, certainly back then. I'm sure it is still today. And so the idea was like, you know, how do you uh, code your problems? Uh, in a way, you know, every time you come up with a program, a software, you know, a computer program, in a way you're weaving the program, right, around some sort of, you know, decision variables. So very naturally the notion of a graph comes up. And then if that graph turns out to be three dimensional or higher dimensional, right, for some reason, how do you tell your hardware, which necessarily has to be two dimensional, at least it was back then, um, you know, what it is. So, so they have these really amazing embedding theorems from graph theory, like, you know, how do you take a high dimensional graph and embed that into a two dimensional, uh, you know, world or fabric that you're going to print your, you know, hardware design on. Um, so I think one of the, the results is called a book graph and several other things. So certainly even in the classical computing theory, that's the case, right, has been. And it's kind of just subsumed into the, you know, uh, experts deal with it at companies now, I guess, who produce hardware. Uh, what we're seeing is that, you know, quantum computing is new, so all of that stuff is kind of coming to the forefront again. And it's great to see that, of course, because, you know, people can get back into this thing. Uh, it's very interesting. Thank you very much for that answer. Thank you. Okay, I think we have another question. Uh, uh, what what type of software, what kind of software did you use in, in your uh, paper? Um, software for calculations. Uh, okay, yeah. so I, I just saw that uh, clarification. So um, personally, my two softwares that I used for so three actually, well, I used Excel to just calculate the the covariances and the from the, to get the historical data of the assets, um, and then I used that information on MATLAB, uh, and I used a genetic algorithm to solve it on the classical computer. Um, but my experience with the quantum computer was through Python. Uh, but I, I think we, there was somebody on the team also used QBSolve to um, solve the problem. So that, that's the software that I can think of. But yeah, for calculations, I it's Python and MATLAB and Excel. Okay, uh, by the way, um Regarding the, the the genetic part or the genetic algorithm, um, mm -hmm. did you use uh, also MATLAB for this part or Python? No, it was just MATLAB for that part. MATLAB. Okay. Okay. But I use MATLAB for the classical part. Okay. No problem. No problem. Uh, was it like a free package in, in, in MATLAB itself, or or uh, did you did you actually write your your own? Uh, no, no, it was the built-in package. Okay. Tech. Okay, that's great. That's great. Perfect. Okay. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to to ask a question or write it down? You can raise your hand if you want. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I think that's it. Uh, Th thank you so much for for your presentation today and and joining us thank and you. uh you, you're most welcome you're most welcome so i'm, I'm sorry <laughs> another question here uh, so the software you use needs a supercomputer i um not the ones i used personally i, I don't know <laughs> i'm not sure um 
but no, I mean, it was a very small problem. I don't, um, if, okay. if you're talking about QB solve, I'm not, I'm not sure, but from my end, I didn't need a supercomputer. Okay. Okay. Um, I think, uh, I think that's it. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, presentation and your time. Uh, it is thank our you pleasure and honor, and honor thank you to much have you. For your time and for your, for your first talk with us. We you. are expecting you to, to join us again. Uh, it is really interesting uh, topic. Um, uh, and uh, I wish you uh, best of luck uh, in, in your uh, master thesis at your work with Dark uh, Lab uh, Quantum. Uh, with, with Dr. Faisal, I think he's will be tough work. So good luck. <laughs> yeah, it's already it's already proving to be tough good work, luck. but it's good. Very uh, exciting. And thank you very much for your for your time today and for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for coming with me on this quantum journey. <laughs>